Fine. I see already many people have joined. Um, welcome everyone, of course. Happy to see so many, so many of you uh, here this afternoon. Yeah, I think we've got we're, we're um, nearly 10, 10 past four. So I think looking at the number of people having already joined, I think we can we can take a start. Um, all right. So welcome everyone this afternoon. Um, as you have, um, I mean, been contacted by Abra earlier this month, um, earlier um, in this quarter, and as announced during the last um, member meeting, we um, we wanted to launch an, an, a new initiative to um, be, let's say, connected with the network more regularly, um, especially in these extraordinary times where we lack um, the possibility to meet in real life, uh, whether that is during our regular um, quarterly meetings um, or in any alternative way, as many of us do connect otherwise during other, let's say at other occasions, which are currently non-existent. So from that thought, let's say we wanted to um, come forward with this initiative to uh, bring us together as a network more regularly to provide you with um, some um, updates and, and, and talking points um, on, let's say, industry developments. And today, the, the intention is to uh, walk you through some of the recent um, developments or important updates with regards to the immigration field, of course, from a Belgian uh, perspective, uh, where I touch, let's say, in, on a high, in a high level way on a few topics that are uh, with many of us uh, on top of mind and uh, we open the floor after the presentation for a Q&A or, or discussion on, on any of the points raised or any other point uh, that let's say you are currently challenged with um, within the area of immigration um, whether that is specific to COVID or to anything else um, that we can discuss about and look at ways to possibly support you from uh, from out of Abra uh, in, 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 in that challenge. Uh, so please do go on to the next slide, Fiona. So for today, um, what I have foreseen is to discuss about the general travel situation update. Uh, in view, of course, of the COVID pandemic situation. Furthermore, um, we have an update on the 2021 immigration salary thresholds that are also important to touch on. Then um, about the EU ICT implementation into the Belgian legislation, as um, also in last instance um, about Brexit and the um, and the, the, the important points to be raised in that sense um, from a Belgian perspective. About the travel situation, so, and, and as I of course presume, and as many of you are um, handling this uh, in, in, in this regard on a daily basis, um, recently and over the course of the last weeks, uh, I would say there have been several developments in the, um, the restrictions that once were in place for travel from outside of the EU. While we zoom in on that um, in, in a second, of course, first of all, you have the, the general principles and conditions for travel within the EU um, and from travel from, from within the EU uh, plus into, into Belgium, where um, most importantly, and up until today, um, it is key, of course, to be um, to be aware of the the color coding still applied by the Belgian government in anticipation of the rollout of the EU-wide color scheme. We are still to apply uh, and follow the the coding as applied by the the Belgian Ministry of Foreign Affairs that you can consult as well on their website. 
um, depending on the on the colors, uh, whether that is red, orange, or green, there are um, there are different measures applicable that you should take into consideration when advising your customers um, or, or when it concerns yourself um, with regards to the travel within the EU plus region. Generally, the travel and as much as that is concerned, especially for essential, I would say business related travel, there aren't so much restrictions in that sense issued by the Belgian government in the sense that travel um, whenever deemed necessary is possible. However, at all times, um, also the host countries, of course, um, can impose restrictions to the entry uh, from, from, our, from Belgium into their um, jurisdiction, which makes it important to always verify at the point of travel where to one is traveling and what are the local, um, I would say, uh, entry um, restrictions as, as well the quarantine measures that, are, that apply. For the travel from outside of the EU plus into Belgium, we have at this point in time a fairly um, flexible um, regime in the sense that um, although the general ban on non-essential travel still applies for um, moves and, and travel related to professional purposes, again, there is a very broad um, there is a very broad um, framework for seen for people to obtain um, an, a green light in order to travel into Belgium from outside of the EU plus, where you have broad uh, exceptions for seen, of course, based on nationality and, re and people who have a residency status in Belgium, yet also for those who do not have a, have a direct tie with Belgium in, on the basis of citizenship, um, Belgian citizenship or EU citizenship or based on an already obtained residence status. There is also foreseen in a, in a relatively flexible regime for those who do not yet have a claim to any of, of the prior mentioned grounds to travel to Belgium on the basis of professional uh, reasons that are considered as essential. Um, where you largely have all those individuals who ha are in possession of a work authorization approval, whether there is for long or short term, can in principle obtain um, a, an entry visa, travel visa, and are permitted to travel to Belgium. Important remark to make on this point under the current, let's say, um, circumstances where there is a, a continuous increase of infections and a worsening of the general pandemic situation. We do see and, ob and observe um, restrictions at um, several embassy diplomatic posts um, towards the possibility to collaborate or to allow visa appointments to take place, regardless of the let's say the overarching framework enabling the obtainment of, um, of, of, of uh, I would say, entry permissions. There is also the practical side to the story, whereby also the local diplomatic post and or, for example, the visa application centers may be impacted in their operations due to the local pandemic situation. Thirdly, um, as applicable, of course, and important to take into consideration in view of any travel coming from outside of Belgium into the, uh, from outside of Belgium, uh, whether that is coming from, from within the EU plus zone or from outside, um, quarantine um, measures always need to be considered as how they apply to the person, to the person traveling into the country. Um, when you regard travel from within the EU plus zone, the quarantine um, as such is not applicable for travel out, uh, coming from a green zone, from travel coming from an orange zone, travel coming from a uh, red zone is in principle subject to quarantine with the exception of certain, um, let's say exemptions for essential activities or when you consider 
a positive outcome by having completed the self-assessment uh, where you can also receive a positive um, self-assessment test result that that lead to a um, conclusion that you would not be subject to the quarantine. Yet, of course, the general recommendation remains that whenever you're coming from a red zone, that you respect to the maximum extent the quarantine measures. Um, coinciding with this, of course, anyone coming from outside of the EU plus region um, falls within scope of the quarantine, has to complete as well the public health passenger locator form under uh, no exception, and has to complete the self-assessment test result. There are a few exceptions to that rule, um, although in the practice, it, it's, it, let's say it's applicable to any traveler to fill out the public health passenger locator form, uh, which explicitly refers to the quarantine requirements. There are certain um, countries that benefit from a, let's say, favorable treatment in that sense, uh, as they are um, considered whitelisted by the Belgian government. They are the green listed countries from the EU uh, Council recommendation from June, as issued in June and updated over the course of the summer, currently still remaining uh, to a list of, of eight countries, including, for example, Canada and Japan, South Korea, uh, Uruguay, um, countries who are not, let's say, uh, subject uh, travelers coming from these countries not being subject to the quarantine with um, in that list an exception being Canada, uh, travelers coming from Canada still appearing to be subject to the quarantine. Um, also important to note that for those travelers coming from the whitelisted countries um, that the, the, the travel ban for non-essential travel is not applicable, meaning that in the end uh, from these jurisdictions um, all travel is possible as long as the travelers respect the general entry um, the entry criteria for traveling to Schengen and onwards into Belgium. We can head into the next slide. Other topic that I wanted to touch on today, as this, this is a recent development and important to all of us in the sector, of course, are the, the 2021 immigration salary thresholds where we have obtained uh, confirmations from Brussels and Flanders region on those. Wallonia still to confirm in the course of the month, uh, we would expect, or in the course of November. Um, of course, the salary immigration thresholds applicable um, to all, um, all the, the permit uh, categories for, as you have highly skilled and, and uh, executive uh, employee EU blue card, as we will uh, look further into this in the next slide, uh, are important to take into consideration as they apply, of course, um, within the context of the calendar year. And employers must at all times ensure compliance with the applicable thresholds, uh, regardless, let's say, whether a permit, as of course, currently we have permits, um, immigration permits valid for more than one year, which may imply that um, you have permits that are valid, um, let's say, with a starting date in 2020 and an expiry date in 2022. Um, of course, doesn't imply that you need to validate and ensure that the immigration salary threshold is met also in the course of 2021, even though you would not have to submit a renewal application, for example. Um, obviously, for any new and renewal application that will be filed uh, with the aim um, of obtaining an, an extension for an expiration that hits in 2021 or for an, a new start date um, entering into 2021, um, is important to know that these applications already need to indicate and demonstrate compliance with the confirmed thresholds. Pending applications that are now under review with the authorities will or may be expected to be subject to additional requests from the authorities to provide uh, statements 
um, by the company, by the employer regarding the compliance with the upcoming thresholds for 2021. And as we will look into the, into the next slides, we can see that for the Flemish region, there are, um, of course, and in comparison as well with, with the Brussels region across the board, the increases are relatively similar in percentage. Uh, yet again, um, it's important to be mindful of those um, as there are, I mean, for example, if you look at the highly skilled, this uh, easily goes up into 1000 euro. So for, uh, for permits uh, for individuals coming, for example, from low wage countries into Belgium, who, whose salary packages are calculated exactly on, for example, the 2020 threshold, it is essential to, um, to, to liaise with the client and to liaise with the, with the respective employer to ensure that they make the necessary adaptations to the salary in order to comply. Uh, and as you can see in this grid, we have, we have um, thresholds confirmed for all of the categories, the, 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 the grid that you can see here um, does not contain all, let's say, immigration salary threshold that apply in Belgium. You also have thresholds for permits for, I would say, for professional um, sports uh, people. Um, yet those are less common and, and are not incorporated in the, into this overview. Um, so the same you will see as well for Brussels as we head into the next slides, um, where it's important, for example, to see that in Brussels there is a, a differentiation in thresholds as well when we consider the, the EUICT permit, where the, the trainee falls under a different threshold compared to, for example, in, in Flanders. This is more aligned to the highly skilled. Um, of course, and as many of you may know, in, in Flanders, uh, as you could see in the in the last slide, there is uh, in that sense also a differentiation on the threshold for um, young, highly qualified employees who are recruited under a Belgian employment contract, where they have a, a threshold installed at 80% of the of the regular highly skilled um, threshold. So this is an important update for everyone to take into consideration on their ongoing new and, and, and pending applications to take this into account. Then as we move into the, the next point, the implementation of the EU ICT, the Intracorporate Transferee Permit, um, is an important development into the Belgian legislation as Belgium being one of the, the last member states to um, implement this um, scheme um, we, we close in that sense the gate a little bit within the EU um, to finally have an implementation into all member states, of course, opening as well um, from a Belgian perspective to uh, companies um, the benefits of the, the use of the EU ICT scheme for the, um, the planning of their multi jurisdictional moves into into the EU using Belgium as a host country um, to allow their foreign um, secondes to um, establish themselves in Belgium under the EU ICT permit as then to use Belgium as a host main host member state out of where they can um, according to the, the needs of their position um, obtain um, EU ICT mobile permits in other member states um, to, to in, 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 in order to legally work in other member states. Um, in Belgium, the implementation is as such effective since October 1st. Yet important to note is that the actual application for EU ICT permits is still somewhat under, under scrutiny in the sense that um, the lack of um, executive legislation uh, does not yet allow in Belgium the issuance of the, the actual physical um, EU ICT residence card, so the, the plastic card as such, uh, where eventually the, the, the reference to the, the status of the foreign national under the EU ICT scheme will be confirmed. 
which means that uh, while and although um, applications in Brussels and soon to be also in the Flemish region will be accepted, that as long as the, the Belgian legislative framework does not yet foresee in the issuance of actual EYCT permits, the, um, the, the, the concerned um, foreigners who would enter Belgium under that basis will not yet receive an actual EYCT permit, which does um, impact, let's say, their ability to also use and fall back on the EU mobility um, provisions um, that, that, let's say, originate from the EYCT scheme um, until the, the, the legislative framework is fully completed with also the executive um, royal decree giving um, giving execution to the to the, uh, the the practical the practicalities of the uh, application process expected is that then those who would enter under the i would say the the, the provisional system procedure should or will be able to convert their card into an uict permit soon as they as as the framework allows Final and definitely not least important point, um, we are close to the end of the transition period um, for Brexit. The, um, the, the transition period is ending on the 31st of December of this year, which implies that as of the 1st of January, um, the UK and their citizens are no longer considered as EU citizens, which means that uh, of course, for any UK citizen, but of course, for all of us working in the industry, it is important to work closely alongside our clients to advise them, of course, um, from where we are standing. We look at primarily, of course, the immigration perspective of, of this issue, that all UK nationals um, who are at this point in time already undertaking activities in Belgium are recommended to um, in that sense, exercise their EU rights and claim their status under the transition agreement and the withdrawal agreement in the sense that they will then benefit from a protected status, allowing them to convert uh, later on their, um, their EU residence card into a residence card issued to UK nationals who have had a residence status under the transition period. Um, allowing them to continue their residence and continue to benefit the, uh, the access to the labor market uh, without uh, requiring an additional work authorization at all of a sudden as from the 1st of January. Of course, for those UK nationals who are foreseen to only engage in activities in Belgium beyond the uh, end of the year, um, it is important to be mindful of the fact that they will require work authorization. They will require um, single permits, depending on the foreseen duration of their move into Belgium, uh, where at this point in time, there hasn't been communicated a formal, I would say, framework for the, um, the allowing the filings of applications, yet informally, there is an understanding that as from the beginning of November, uh, permit applications should be possible uh, on behalf of UK nationals uh, to enable um, employers to foresee in the necessary authorizations to allow their um, UK employees to legally work in, in Belgium as from, um, as from January onwards. Um, and as indeed said earlier on, those UK nationals who have um, claimed their status uh, before the 31st of December, meaning those who have at least started the registration before the end of the year will, in the course of the first half of 2021, need to uh, come forward uh, based uh, per the invitation that they um, are expected to receive from the local communes to convert their um, residence cards into a, um, into a specific residence card showing their protected status.
bring us to the to the end of these four points um, and, and allowing us to open the floor for any thoughts, considerations, questions that, that anyone in the group would like to bring forward for us to discuss together. Um, perhaps I should like, thank you, Alexander. Um, just to let you know, I believe I've muted everybody. The easiest way to speak um, is just to hit your shift bar. Uh, no, the space bar, excuse me. Uh, or unmute it in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. Um, I was wondering uh, for the, the UK nationals, because you mentioned that uh, from mid next year onwards, you will get a, Bel a specific Belgian ID. Uh, is it known already how long it will be valid that protected status that they will get? Well, the, the status, um, the, the protected status is a lifelong benefit. Until, of course, you would lose your residence, your claim to a residence status in Belgium due to a, um, an extensive absence from the territory. So in that sense, those who have a residence status or have applied for a residence status under their EU citizenship and before the end of the year, they will, these individuals will receive the regular, currently still electronic e-card, and they will need to um, go to the town hall as it's currently foreseen before the mid of 2021 to convert or let's say exchange their residence card for an alternative card that will make clear reference to their status under the <coughs> under the transition period. So that will that will grant them or that that will let's say um, officialize their their protected status, also their their specific status of set let's say to differentiate them from all of the other EU nationals still having the e card for future reference that they have the, let's say the yeah the the unlimited continuation of their status in Belgium. Um, of course, that is in Belgium as um, former EU national um, um, in, in Belgium. It remains, of course, important that to note and, and for general awareness that this status will imply a continuation of their benefits from a Belgian immigration point of view with regards to the the residency and the access to the labor market, yet this does not automatically imply, of course, the same in the other member states, for example, towards the right to work and, and, and the right to, um, to reside in, in other member states, because towards those, this UK national will be a third country national. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Alexander, uh, Dave here, Dave De Reiter. Um, is there any uh, impact of the uh, new COVID-19 measures that the government has uh, issued uh, as from this Monday uh, on uh, um, There, There haven't been made any, um, any um, decisions to to um, to implement again restrictions on the travel in from let's say from coming from outside of the EU at this point in time based on the observations that we make due to the the increase of infections we do notice um, a few additional challenges in the sense that um, we we see issues popping up at various diplomatic posts and, and visa application centers, despite, let's say, the, the framework enabling, enabling access, the, the practical side does um, give issues, as well as, um, as you may have all heard as well in the news today, the quarantine, although um, decreased in um, duration to seven days, 
those people who are subject to the mandatory quarantine yet do not show any symptoms would not be tested leading to the fact that the quarantine would be 10 days instead of seven days but this is also still a bit let's say in a gray zone it hasn't been uh, communicated officially yet but this is let's say practical information that is important to to keep in mind um, and of course we have to remain realistic that um, that that more strict measures may follow um, in the coming days or week or weeks thank you alexander I'm actually curious uh, to hear from, I, I don't know if there's any other um, questions for Alex. I'm, I'm just curious to see how much are people actually traveling at the moment? I'd, I'd be intrigued to know more. I feel from my experience that, that, that at this point in time, or at least that that's how I experienced this, those who had planned to travel or there is this window of time now that I feel that now for at least for business purposes people do um, let's say travel um, yet of course still less less than than we were used to in anticipation of, of, of worsening of the situation towards the end of the year uh, this is this is a, a period that I feel that more people are on the move. Thank you. Yeah, that, that makes sense to me. Um, absolutely. I think uh, it'll be interesting to see how we go the coming weeks. Yes. We just noticed the same thing. It was quite uh, it was a quiet summer, not as usual. So uh, yeah, we had the same same question. Thank you, Alexander, for a nice presentation and for. But the, my question, for example, is how about the people that are, as you said, to mention the third countries, like the outside of European Union, to get into European Union now? Because I, what I read recently that European Union was kind of in phases, phasing out the kind of issuing visas for people outside of European Union. So first was just European Union and then everybody else. So how about that? Yeah, so at this point in time, as such, the, 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 the general framework from a Belgian perspective allows um, non-EU nationals who have um, a visa D, who have an authorization to work uh, in Belgium or who can demonstrate their, um, their, their rights or their, their, the essential need for them to perform certain activities under the scope of a work authorization exemption they are under in principle permitted to travel to belgium of course and that is at this point in time as we see over the last days seems to be coming more um, challenging as there are local issues with um, diplomatic posts who have um, or who are deciding to limit or reduce their services to essential assistance um, and at this point in time also us we are in, um, in an investigative mode to exactly understand what is happening um, as it's not clear um, based on the, the, the let's say the, the theoretic uh, framework what is going on globally uh, with regards to the, the more the physical issuance of the visas Thank you. That's where I, I, what I understood was also kind of one of the main problems was actually the, the diplomatic, um, yeah, in, in the countries of origin was the people are coming here. So that was kind of the, the services were kind of minimized or sometimes non-existent. Mm -hmm. I see. Hi, I actually Alexander, have... can you look into the chat? Because there's a question in the chat. Yeah. yeah. 
Indeed, and that's also what Annika is mentioning about the, the IT issues uh, there might be in, in, in the, let's say, the networks of the diplomatic posts. It's not clear what is actually going on. Um, and, and, and this is something that we are, um, of course, trying to, to understand better. If there is anyone who has the necessary intel, I would say, then, then I think it would be very, very good to share with, with the group. I might, <clears throat> I might have a remark in that respect um, about this IT problem. Uh, we called the uh, immigration office still uh, this morning for that. And they told uh, they have found the problem, but they are now solving it. But they don't know by when yet. So it would take one week or maximum two weeks uh, before they can actually issue the visa again. So this is indeed about so what you are saying in, in the global issue with regards to the that is affecting the ability to to issue and, and the stickers, visa. yeah, yeah, the actual visa D stickers in the passport. Uh, apparently, there's a problem with the IT uh, behind it. Um, we had not yet heard it in a general way, but uh, it, for in in this case, it were Japanese nationals, uh, the family. Uh, who was waiting for Visa D and they could not yet get it because of the IT problem. And then uh, the foreigner's office told us that, uh, yeah, that they, are, they, they have found a problem, but now they still have to solve it. So, okay. it's a typical answer. For, <laughs> for sharing, this is indeed one side of, of what I feel that is going on. Uh, with then, in addition, local, due to local. Um, health situations that, that you seem to get messages, receive messages on restrictions of services in, in local TLS centers or um, v, VFS application centers. So there is this general yeah, um, realm of, 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 of um, hurdles. Mm -hmm. it, they told it would be general, but um, it was also new, let's say. Okay. For this morning. Okay, thanks. Thanks for sharing. Alexander, there is another question in the chat from Sabine Kastrik. When non-EU nationals enter Belgium with their D visa, do customs ask to see a letter confirming their job is essential or is the D visa sufficient? The D visa should be sufficient. The essential travel certificates would is only mandatory um, for those traveling to Belgium um, on a visa waiver for short-term travel um, or those who have a Schengen visa that was issued before I think March 18 if that because th that's that visa Schengen v when still valid um, it's considered that it was issued prior to the whole um, spike in the global pandemic situation. And that would also then trigger the need for the travel certificate. Mm -hmm. So it, I think it's important to um, anyone traveling without a visa, the, the recommendation is the travel certificate, the essential travel certificate, as well as those with a Schengen visa, type C visa, that has been issued, I would say, anywhere close to mid-March of this year to be on the safe side. Thank you. Does that, uh, Sabine and Annika, does that answer your questions? Uh, I'm getting a yes, thank you. <laughs> Hello, this, uh, this is Massimo. Hey, Massimo, how are you? I just want to take the opportunity because this is the first time I'm joining uh, the event with Abra. So I just want to say hi. 
and maybe also point out that um, for our company, uh, we've seen a rise in initiations again. So things are looking up. And from a social point of view, I've realized uh, due to the lockdown that apparently I'm more of a social be being than I uh, knew of myself. And that these type of video conferences are not not what I want in the future. So <laughs> I, I'm hoping to see everyone in person soon and, and also for, for clients, for, for meetings. Um, I don't like this. It's, it's, you see each other, but you're also, it's, it's too far away. So it's, it's uncomfortable to me to, to be talking to you while seeing my own screen. Um, so hopefully, hopefully, you can next year think your screen is smaller, Massimo, and then <laughs> yours bigger. Okay. <laughs> well, luckily, you don't see me as big as I see my head here. <laughs> well, that's it. I think things are looking up. So um, yes. I'm optimistic about the future for our business. Yeah. I think we should all are. I mean, in the end, there's good things happening for Belgium. Um, and, and, I mean, if, if the, the global situation improves and if we um, continue to ride on this, on this, let's say, momentum, as it, it looks good for Belgium as, as a jurisdiction. So uh, for all of us in the sector, let's, let's just hope that indeed the situation stabilizes and then um, good, I mean, better days uh, are ahead for sure. I agree. I, I think I we're all. Question. Sorry. Can I ask a question? Yes. Yeah. So, um, so I actually work at the International School of Brussels with Amy, my colleague, who's also on this on this call. Um, and I know we've been in touch in the past with Abra a bit. Um, and um, so schools are are remaining open in Belgium at the moment, um, as you know. Um, and we are still um, welcoming families from all over the world. Um, we're still doing campus visits, but of course we need to bear in mind the measurements that that you know that you've just um, explained to us and that the government has um, has issued. So I was just wondering. Um, thank you for the presentation. It was it was it was very um, useful. I was just wondering if there was any other important messages or, or or suggestions or advice for schools at the moment that have. Um, you know, that have so many families coming from all over the world. Perhaps it's just the measures that you explained, but maybe there's something something else that we should be made aware of or, or that we should know about at the moment. Hmm. I can't really think of something right away that, that in addition to what we already have discussed or, or covered, is still um, could still be an eye opener for you. Um, no, no. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> maybe just uh, make sure not only that they follow the rules, but maybe that they download uh, the COVID nineteen uh, uh, tracking app. Yeah. Yeah, we're we we we're insisting on that because on campus as well to to follow you know how much campus transmission there is with so many students, um, we we're it's easier for us to do the contact tracing um, if someone gets sick. So, thank you, thanks for that. Thank you, thank you, everyone. I suppose um, I mean we're we're closing in on fifty minutes. Is there anything else we'd like to talk about? Um, any topics, any questions at all? Only that I share the optimism uh, of Massimo, Alexander uh, and all the others that have uh, testified. I mean, come on, we have a moral obligation as humans to be positive, eh? whatever happens. Eh? Of course, eh? we have to tackle the issues as they come. And uh, eh? that's all we can do. 
Take care. Thanks, Dave. I think, uh, yeah, absolutely. I'm uh, looking forward to the day we can all meet in person again for certain. I, I can only second that sentiment. Yes. So um, on which note, thank you everybody so much for joining us. Uh, we hope you will join us again next month. We've got uh, an entirely different topic. We will be uh, we're speaking to two authors, Marie Gerkens and Karim Bormans, who wrote a book uh, for trailing spouses, essentially, uh, what you can do, how you can keep active and stay at work when you follow your partner out on their assignment. So um, I'm looking forward to it. I hope you will all join us for that as well. And um, have a great week ahead. And thank you again, Alexander and Chris and everybody who shared their questions and insights.